So if you're watching this video, it's because you want to know what's going on with the Crocus City Hall, the facts behind it. This is going to be a deep dive into that. We're going to look at three big stories. The first is Vladimir Putin's statements yesterday about this in his official video conference. The second is an article where we're going to try to understand exactly what happened. This is Moscow attack, debunking the false claims. And then the third is then going to be looking at Putin, the terror attack, and the threat whose name he dare not speak, which is absolutely fascinating. So if you're interested in the deep dive, you're in the right video. If you're not interested, if you just want surface level bullet points, this is not the right place for you. Okay, with that being said, let's begin with the president of Russia's actual video conference where he was meeting with the heads of government and regions and security services and law enforcement. So Putin kind of doubled down on this idea that it was Ukraine. Okay, the investigation must proceed with the utmost professionalism and objectivity, which is funny because he's not really objective. He's really convinced that it's all about Ukraine with no political bias whatsoever. We know that the crime was perpetrated by radical Islamists. Okay, so we got that part right. The Islamic world itself has been fighting this ideology for centuries, but we are also seeing how the United States is using different channels to try and convince its satellites and other countries of the world that according to its intelligence, there is supposedly no sign of Kiev's involvement in the Moscow terrorist attack, and that the deadly terrorist attack was perpetrated by followers of Islam, members of ISIS, and organization banned in Russia. Okay, so it's, we know that is, I, ISIS, Islam did it, but you know how the U.S. is, are trying to convince everybody that Kiev wasn't involved. <laughs> like you have to get into you bend yourself into contortions to follow his logic. We know whose hands were used to commit this atrocity against Russia and its people. That's the ISIS people that they've caught. We want to know who ordered it. That's he's saying different than ISIS. For example, do radical and even terrorist Islamic organizations truly have an interest in launching attacks on Russia now that it supports a fair resolution of the escalated conflict in the Middle East? Yeah, they still do. They're still holding grudges. And how do radical Islamists who present themselves as devout Muslims and follow the so-called pure Islam justify committing atrocities and serious crimes during the holy month of Ramadan, which is sacred to all Muslims? Because if they get to kill Christians or what they consider Christian, the Christian world, people in that, especially Russians who they still have a grudge against, they're going to do it. I mean, that's it's that simple. One thing is absolutely clear, the heinous crime committed in the Russian capital on March 22nd is an act of intimidation, as I said. Okay, I'm not sure that it is. I think it's just an act of terrorism. By the way, they're naming the date on March 22nd. March 22nd is going to be like their 9-11. I mean, they're, they're really going to feel it in that way. And um, it's, it's really weird to me. Our sympathies would be with Russia if it wasn't for what they were doing with Ukraine. We'd be like, you know, that terrorism that they're doing there in Moscow and that place, that's not right. But it, it's hard to get there with everything else that Russia is doing to Ukraine right now. It's just, it's an odd thing. The, this leads to the next question. Who stands to benefit from it? This act of violence is likely just one in a series of attempts by those who have been fighting against our country since the 2014, using the neo-Nazi Kiev regime as a pawn. So it's either Kiev or the U.S. using them as a pawn and like, okay. Uh, the Russian armed forces are maintaining the initiative along the entire front line. These bloody acts of intimidation, like the terrorist attack in Moscow, fits logically into the sequence. Their goal, as I mentioned, is to sow panic in our society while demonstrating to their own people that not all hope is lost for the Kyiv regime. I can't tell if Putin really believes this or if he's just trying to use this politically in order to refocus on Ukraine. It's, it's hard to understand what's going on here, but he keeps pointing it back to Ukraine. Of course, we must also answer the question of why the terrorists, after committing the crime, attempted to flee specifically to Ukraine. Who was waiting for them there? But they didn't. They didn't try to flee to Ukraine. They were actually trying to get into Belarus. Go ask Lukashenko what was going on. Okay. And then they go on and on uh, talking to different cabinet mem members in here. But those were Putin's words. Okay. Let's go get the play-by-play -play now. Moscow attack debunking the false claims. This is the BBC seven hours ago. 
First accusations. So accusations were made almost immediately after the initial reports of the attack on Crocus City Hall emerged on social media 7.15 GMT on Friday. So, I mean, it was real quick. Like something happened and they were like, hey, it's Ukraine doing this. Pro-Russian pundit Sergei Markov for example, said at 8.25 GMT that the attackers looked like Islamic radicals, but he went on to add without any evidence that the attack was likely organized from Kiev. Okay. Some 40 minutes later, 9.03 GMT, Muscovy Kosomolets, a national tabloid, quoted military expert Roman Shukratov as saying that the attack may have been organized with the support of Ukraine security service and military intelligence. Well, it may have been, but he had no facts. He was just saying, well, this may have been what's going on. At nine, uh, 1927 GMT, Russia's ex-president Dmitry Medvedev vowed revenge if Ukraine was involved. Okay, so they just started with it. And it's really easy to fall into this and like what you want to see you, what you expect to see is what you do start seeing and start talking about. And they're talking about it as if it's true, whether they had any information or credible information or not. The fake claim of responsibility. One, Russia's, uh, one of Russia's main TV channels aired a video clip claiming that it showed a senior Ukrainian official confirming his country's involvement. Danilov appeared to, to say... It's fun in Moscow today. I think it's a lot of fun. I would like to believe that we will arrange such fun for them more often. Well, that was all made up. It was a fake clip. It was something that was uh, proven to be not an actual thing of him saying it at that time. It was spliced between two different clips from the past, and it was proven to be so. An official accusation was made in Vladimir Putin's address on Saturday. The Russian president said the assailants were caught as they were trying to flee Ukraine, where, quote, a window for crossing the border was prepared for them, unquote. However, Russia has not presented evidence of a window to let the attackers through. Like, how are they going to get through? Like, this is like one of the worst places to go if they're trying to escape Russia to a place where lots of Russian soldiers are defending the borders against Ukrainians. Despite Putin's claim, the arrest took place a long way from the Ukrainian border. By matching background details in their environment, we know two of the arrested suspects were filmed about 90 miles from the Ukraine border. Okay, so here is the Crocus City Hall, and here's the site of the arrest. It's near the Belarusian border, um, which is running around over here. So it's, okay, um, and the Ukrainian border is a little ways down. Okay, so uh, responsibility has been claimed by the Islamic State, and they're recognizing that, but they're saying, yeah, even though they did it, they're not the ones who are, actually caused it. But despite the evidence, Russia continues to accuse Ukraine. Margarita Simonyan said on X that the attackers were not from IS, the Islamic State, because they were not wearing suicide vests and had no intention to die. That doesn't mean that they can't be from the Islamic State. What do we know about the suspects? Well, the attackers drove in a white Renault. Uh, well, matches of the vehicle are seen in a separate video used to flee the concert hall be before being detained. One man was arrested near the vehicle. The other three fled into the nearby woods and were detained following the search. Weapons and Tajik passports were recovered from the Renault. On Sunday, footage was published of the men being escorted into a Moscow court. And they were, you know, escorted in there, bloodied, beaten, whatever else. How reliable is uh, the Islamic State's claim of responsibility? So that's another thing. Like, like nobody anywhere doesn't believe that the Islamic State did it. Like, they claim to do it. The question to Russian minds is, why did they do it? Whose orders were they following? Or they may be a little bit embarrassed, like, oh, I wish they'd stop talking about that because we know that they did it. The existence of a highly graphic video filmed by the attackers while carrying out the killings, their use of slogans common among IS attackers in the video, and its dis distribution via official IS, that's Islamic State, media channels are consistent with the group's modus operandi. Okay, an image of the attackers inside the Crocus City Hall more than two weeks before the attack has been published by Russian media, suggesting it had been pre-planned, so they were casing the joint. 
Okay, this is not the first time that the Islamic State has targeted Russia. Two other major attacks happened in 2015, 2018, along with lower level ones in recent years. Okay, so that's what you need to know as all the background story of what's happened, what's not happened. Now, that leads us to this interview, Putin, the terror attack, and the threat whose name he dare not speak. I, just watch this. This is really, really interesting. The extremist group, the Islamic State, claimed responsibility for the attack. And we know that. Everybody agrees to that. Russian expert Mark Galati is a political analyst, author, and honorary professor at the UCL School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies in London. Okay, so they're going to ask him a number of questions. Here's the setup question from Radio Free Europe. This was the first major of attack, attack of its kind in Russia since, I believe, 2017, and by far the deadliest in almost 20 years. Again, this is like their 9-11. It's not quite to the scale. It's a fraction of the scale, but it's still, in the psyche, it's pretty significant. In his first public remarks on the Crocus City Hall attack, which came more than 18 hours after the attack, Putin claimed, without providing evidence, that Ukraine had provided a window on the border between Russia and Ukraine to enable the attackers to try to escape. Kyiv has adamantly denied any involvement. And, of course, Islamic State has claimed responsibility. What about those who say Russia could have staged this as a false flag? Galati responds, We tend to obviously come back to these false flag allegations, particularly because of the 1999 apartment bombings that in so many ways eased the way for a relatively unknown Putin to become president. However, just because there was that one particular case, we shouldn't assume that everything that happens is a false flag. Now, let's look at uh, Anders Puck Nielsen, because he was just talking about this as well. And he's, he was saying, yeah, I don't think it's a false flag. And he gave his reasons. But here, listen to what he has to say. So long story short, I don't think this was a false flag operation. It was a real terrorist attack, and it caught the Russian government by surprise. And it's inconvenient for them, because the last thing they want to do now is to have to focus their attention on Central Asia or the Middle East. They want to focus on Ukraine. And Okay, that last little bit that he said about focusing on Central Asia and Ukraine is really in... Uh, as a, he, they don't want to focus on Central Asia. They want to focus on Ukraine. You'll see why he's saying that in just a moment. The idea that, oh, well, there is no security guards at Crocus. Well, we know that there were. The Agalorovs, Lorovs, that's the owners of it have said so, and at least one security guard, I think, was killed in the attack, and we have other cases of security guards leading people to safety and so forth, so that's not true. It's not It's not really in the main security zone, like the, where the Crocus uh, Hall was. It wasn't like in Red Square or something along those lines. As regards to the suggestion that it took an hour for emergency services to arrive, even though there's a base of National Guard's OMON police just about 10 minute drive down the road, in fact, it seems to have taken more like 30 to 35 minutes for them to arrive, and the terrorists were out in 20 to 25. So it was, it's been over overblown. Like it, maybe before they all descended or something, I, I don't know. But okay, that these things take time. It takes time for people to raise the alarm, for people to realize quite what's going on, for orders to be given for the special weapons forces to be mobilized, issued their guns, loaded up in the vans, and so forth. So I think it's highly unlikely that this will be used as a pretext for some kind of national mobilization unless he was already planning it. And that may very well be what was going on if you see a mobilization come as a consequence of this to say, well, we have all these threats. Well, you were already planning to do that if that's, if that's what turns out to happen. Actually, he ends up looking quite weak out of this, and that's a case that Anders was also making, that he, the last thing that Putin wants to look like is weak. He, he's okay with looking like an evil genius with a false flag. He's okay with looking like it's the Ukrainians because he can blame them, but he doesn't want to look weak. Because there's not going to be some kind of great catharsis outcome. I think we can set aside the false flag notion just as we can set aside the Ukraine element. The SBU, the Security Service of Ukraine, have been carrying out what we would call sort of terrorist tactic operations within Russia, sometimes precisely by recruiting dupes, but nonetheless, there's absolutely no evidence that Ukraine had any responsibility in this, and I'm not sure that I would call this terrorist attack. I would call this taking the fight to your enemy. That's just me.
Islamic State, uh, which is a sort of affiliate of in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia, has long regarded the Russian crusaders as being their main target. They carried out a variety of terrorist attacks in Russia over recent years. These are people who clearly have the means to carry out terrorist operations, particularly armed terrorist operations. They claim credit, like Everybody knows they claim credit. They claim credit. Even Putin begrudgingly admitted it, but said they're just the hands. They're not actually, you know, the force behind it. But they also have demonstrated a certain amount of information about the attack. I mean, they've been able to provide stuff. See, we did it. We have the video, that kind of thing. Okay. Putin, when he finally did come out and make remarks about the attack, made no mention of Islamic State, at least at first. In subsequent comments aired late on March 25th, Putin said that the attack had been carried out by radical Islamists, but suggested without evidence that Ukraine and the West may have played roles. You just heard me read that. Why do you think Putin avoided mention of the Islamic State? So, Galati responded, it may well be precisely embarrassment, having so publicly just a few days earlier criticized America for its warning, saying that, in fact, it was all sort of a pro provocation and an attempt at intimidation. Maybe he didn't actually want to admit it. Well, I, I get that. I wouldn't want to admit it either if I was him. It's, it's clearly a black eye. Secondly, I think there's a clear political desire to use this precisely to vilify the Ukrainians. That makes sense. I mean, I get why he would want to do that. So, from his point of view, any time he can adduce something as evidence that Kiev is in the group of neo-Nazi terroristic state, that's good for him. Perhaps most importantly, there's actually a serious policy dilemma here, and that's what I wanted to uh, tune you to about what Anders Puck uh, Nielsen talked about, about Central Asia. If he says, yes, this was the Islamic State operating through the medium of Central Asian residents and guest workers, then firstly, it aggravates racial tensions, which actually is a problematic issue in a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional state like the Russian Federation, where 10% of the population is Muslim. The inevitable corollary would be some kind of crackdown on Central Asians, which, as we know from past experience, would be handled in a fairly thuggish and insensitive way. At the moment, Russia cannot afford to alienate and drive out these Central Asian workers. Well, why? Because it needs them. It needs them to do the work that, frankly, there aren't Russians to do or that Russians don't want to do. And you don't want to go to war with a Central Asian state or you don't want to get into some kind of hostilities there when you want to keep your eye on Ukraine. So between the impact of the war and the need to have defense factories running at full pelt, there is actually a shortage of labor. So to actually exacerbate that risk by driving Central Asians out of the country, that would directly impact his war effort and also have diplomatic implications with his relations with the Central Asian countries. Yeah, and, and you know, some of the stand countries have been not uh, answering Putin's phone calls or making them wait when they're, when they're um, meeting diplomatically. Like, no, Putin makes you wait. But since Ukraine, kind of Central Asia has been making Putin wait. It's been a really interesting shift, which are feeling much, much less intimidated by Moscow now and which Moscow needs because these are crucial routes for sanction busting smuggling into Russia of all kinds of spare parts, materials, microchips, and whatever. And there have been multiple studies about how trade with these stand countries has gone up radically and mostly with like computer parts and things along those lines. It's sold there and then resold into Russia. Okay, I think he was afraid, frankly, of pointing the finger at Central Asians. They had become in some ways the new Navalny, the threat which he dare not speak their name. Therefore, he just defaulted to these, frankly, rather lackluster and unconvincing claims about some sort of unspecified Ukrainian connection. It's absolutely fascinating that Putin, in trying to take Ukraine, is actually kind of beholden to the Central Asians who he really needs that he kind of used to dominate. Okay. Why is this? Well, not he. The Soviet Union used to dominate, but you understand my concept here. Why has this happened now? Does Russia now face a major new or revived threat of militant attacks? And three, how are Putin and the government likely to respond with both Russia and in terms of any actions abroad or any change in the way Moscow wages war against Ukraine? So Galati replies, we have to recognize that Russia has continued to face a terrorist threat. That terrorist threat never went away. It's just that Russia has been very involved in Ukraine and we've just been focusing on that element. So these people were, were brewing behind the scenes, waiting for something to happen, and it finally went pop.
Why now? I think these kinds of attacks tend to be opportunistic rather than anything else. One can point to certainly some factors that might have contributed. It may well be that in fact the security forces have been rather distracted by the two priorities coming down from the Kremlin, Ukraine and tamping down the political opposition. So if security forces are focused on these things, they're not focused on this thing, and it slipped through the cracks. Unfortunately, the depressing, banal answer is that these things will happen, and they will happen when they happen, because sometimes terrorists will get through. As for the context of how Russia will respond, we can almost think of this in three dimensions. One of them is assuming that they keep pushing this notion of the Ukrainian dimension, which is you know, the usual toxic, outspoken Kremlin talking heads, Solyov and others like that will keep saying Ukraine did it, Ukraine did it, Ukraine did it. But actually, the more professional observers and commenters are being a lot more restrained about this. They're certainly not saying Ukraine was behind this. They are maybe accepting that there was an element of facilitating, but I have a suspicion that there's a degree of embarrassment within the more professional community about this fairly blatant false claim. In Ukraine, there isn't really much scope for escalation. So you can say, well, we're going to do this to you as a consequence, Ukraine. We're going to, well, what really are you going to do more than what you've done? Right? Really? Right? What, how are you going to escalate? A lot will depend on how the politics of the situation emerges. We've seen these horrific videos of security forces dealing with the alleged terrorists, one of whom seems to have his genitals attached to an electric battery, and the other who seems to have had part of his ear cut off and put in his mouth. In order to satisfy the baying of the majority, Putin may well be willing to actually countenance some kind of crackdown on a minority. So we still may see him forced into a position where he has to do some kind of performative bloodletting. I think he's trying to avoid it, but if that's what he'll do, well, that's what he'll do if he needs to do it. The third real issue in terms of his response is this. It was striking when before the terrorist attack, we had a presidential spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, make this interview with Russian media outlet where he used the W word, war, related to the Ukrainian war, right? I mean, you couldn't call it that. You would call it a special military operation. But he was simply reiterating the wider question about the fact that as far as the Kremlin's concerned, what's happening in Ukraine, their special military military operation, so-called, is just one part of one front of a wider war with the West. Like, that's their mentality still. Putin had used the language in his State of the Union address on February 29th and so forth, but the interesting thing was his mention of this notion of war being important in terms of shaping Russian sense of their internal mobilization. The idea Russians now think of themselves as being on a wartime footing, and that's, that's a pretty significant change over the last few months. What do Russians internalize about the threats facing them? Do they actually think that everything is about Ukraine and the West? Do they actually think that this is some kind of nasty, insidious terrorist attack? Or do they actually begin to think of Putin as failing? That's going to be a whole different ballgame. He's already failed as the great provider because of their quality of life, which is beginning to be impinged. And if that begins to take root, then I think we'll see the Kremlin being pushed into even more extreme actions to try and demonstrate to Russians that it's indeed still able to protect them from all the enemies that are besieging them. So Radio Free Europe says, Putin really, as you said, dismissed and kind of angrily criticized the U.S., warning that there could be an attack. Why do you think he did that? Galati's response was, I think the Americans clearly gave this warning in good faith. However, Putin has a tendency to mirror image. Stop. Absolutely. Whatever he sees the Americans do, he thinks, well, there must be this motive behind it, because that's what I would do, <laughs> right? It's a very strange thing, but like the Soviets used to do that. They thought Reagan was going to nuke them, because like, why would he do this Star Wars thing? Like, uh, okay, same kind of thing. I suspect that just as he probably wouldn't hesitate to issue a bogus warning for political informational purposes, I think that when those 48 hours the warning pertained to, which was March 8th through 9th, had passed without incident, I think he got angry and thought this was, in fact, an attempt by the Americans to rattle Russians before the elections. Remember, one of the key Kremlin goals was precisely to ensure that there was a high turnout. Remember, high turnout means I have a mandate. If people are worried that some place where you cluster together might become a terrorist attack, then conceivably it might have affected turnout. So I think that Putin, imputing on Americans precisely the kind of goals that he might have had, decided to angrily strike back. 
To say that there may be an attack, and it may be an attack on some large gathering, including concerts, and it may be at some point this month, is not really very actionable. It's clear that Putin had just convinced himself that those perfidious Americans could not possibly be actually passing on a good faith warning, and that it was all just some attempt to undermine his own triumph in the election. Okay, so that's some perspective here. Like, Putin's really in a bind. He can't, like, we think of him as far more powerful than he actually is. He has to play with the cards that he's dealt. And one of the cards that he's been dealt was, like, you really can't pick a fight with a Tajikistan government or uh, ethnically pick on Tajikistanis just because of this. And you want to avoid that because you want to keep your eye on Ukraine, but you can't really tie it to Ukraine. Even if you're saying it's Ukraine, it's Ukraine, it's Ukraine. And it's really amazing to watch. Okay. That's the deep dive into the Moscow attack. We did, we listened to Putin, we debunked false claims and we saw where he's going or what he can and can't do. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes. If this was helpful, put it in the comments below. Help me understand if this was useful, if it wasn't, if it was too long, if it wasn't deep enough. Um, thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and the coffees. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.